let me introduce the panelists. So we have four panelists. You can see them here. Um, the CEO of Java Foods, Monica Musonda. The CEO of Nigeria Investment Promotion Council, Yewande Sadiku. The founder of the African Leadership Academy, Fred Swanika. And the co-founder and CEO of Paystack, Shola Akinlade. Um, you can see it's an amazing panel. And we have, uh, we're looking forward to the discussion. So are my panelists on the line and ready to take their questions? We'll be discussing the future we want, an action plan for accelerated development and the role of women and youth as a growth multiplier. All right, so let's start with your opening comments. And I'll start with, in the order in which I introduced you. So we'll start with Monica. Monica, um, good afternoon. And please, you can access Monica's um, full profile on the Whisker um, website, whisker.ng. So Monica, please let us have your opening comments. The future we want, an action plan for accelerated development and the role of women and youth as a growth multiplier. Please give us your opening comments. Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry about that. Good afternoon. <laughs> yeah, just trying to unmute myself. Thank you very much for having me and congratulations to Whisker for an amazing conference. I'm not sure you've seen the numbers. It is phenomenal. I have not seen a conference like this with so many participants. So very, very well done. Um, and congratulations to all the mentees who are graduating. Um, so I'll get straight to your question. And it's really important given what we have gone through this year, the need for a much more inclusive society given um, the shocks we've had and the fact that we've been unable really, we, we weren't prepared for them. And it's really teaching us to do things rather urgently and really much more inclusively. The only way we are going to change our current situation, and I, I must say this, we, they, they're, they're, they have been strides. I mean, we've just heard um, what has been done, people who have benefited from very strong women teams. So we have to acknowledge there have been strides over the years. However, a lot more needs to be done and well done to Whisker for taking the leadership in this. So to go back to your question, the future we want to see is a, a future where women will stand equally, equal with men, that their work will be recognized. Many years ago, people would think um, that women were, were held back when going to school. This is now not the case. We are now able to compete, to get into school, to have, um, get degrees, et cetera. However, we are still not being formally recognized in the same numbers at work, in public service, in public sector as well. So we are really keen to push forward from where we are to make sure we have a much more inclusive society where our leadership roles are recognized in every sector. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me move over. Actually, let me, we've got two ladies and we've got two gentlemen. So let me intersperse them, okay? And I'm gonna move over to Fred Swanika. So Fred, um, you, you know the question, you know what we're discussing, right? The future we want and, the, and youth as a growth multiplier. Um, you, I, you have a lot of experience with that with your African Leadership Academy. What opening comments do you have for us? Thank you. And uh, first, let me also add my words of congratulations to uh, the founder of Whisker. I mean, after this great conference and it's been inspiring listening to all the previous speakers. Um, you know, in the work that I do, you know, we, we have set out to develop Africa's future leaders. We have a goal of developing 3 million leaders in the next 15 years. Um, we have made a commitment that 50% of those leaders will be young women. Uh, and that's because we believe that, um, you know, women are really a hidden treasure in Africa and completely untapped potential. Uh, it just makes common sense. You know, if you believe that, um, intelligence and creativity and uh, sheer human capacity uh, is evenly spread in the in the in the in a population. Then, until we um, as long as long as we um, are not uh, empowering women, we are losing fifty percent 
of our problem solving capabilities. We're losing 50% of the ideas in, in a society. We're losing 50% of the energy in a society. And so um, Africa is not going to move forward unless women fully participate in all segments of society from government to business to technology to you know, civil society. We need women in leadership roles. We need women making decisions. We need women running organizations and leading society. So without that, we're not going anywhere as a continent. We will only achieve 50% of our potential. Um, and also, you know, a lot of research shows that the ripple effects of educating and empowering women uh, tend to be greater than men because of the impact that they have on children. Women who are educated uh, tend to have fewer children. They tend to educate their children. And so therefore, the ripple effect on society is much, much greater than similar investments in men. And so, it, you know, I think that, uh, you know, this is uh, something that is really long overdue. Africa will continue to remain behind the rest of the world unless we unlock the potential of our women. And I'm excited that WISCA is, is driving that uh, in, in Nigeria and, you know, looking forward to seeing how we can support. Okay. The technology ghost in the machine has struck again. All right. Well, while we wait for Kadria to return, uh, let me move on to Yewande Sadiku. Yewande is CEO of the Nigeria Investment Promotion Council. And Yewande, has, Yewande is one of those women that uh, Atedo Peter Said was referring to, the women on whose backs his business grew. So Yewande, you know, with the effects of COVID-19, on the economies in all over Africa, Nigeria specifically, you know, this would have definitely affected your portfolio of attracting foreign di um, direct investment into Nigeria. So what opportunities does the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement present, especially in the light of, you know, women and youth as a growth multiplier? Over to you, Yuande. Lovely to have you with us. I hope you can hear me now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for having me on this fantastic event. I've enjoyed um, all of the presentations that have been made so far, all of the speakers that have spoken. Um, and I congratulate, you know, Mrs. O for carrying this event for 11 years and keeping it going Even at this level. Yes. Can you hear me well? Yeah, you very well. Please go ahead. Okay, fantastic. So before I respond to the question, I just wanted to make a couple of points. The first one is, yes, I, when um, Atado Side was speaking about growing on the back of people, on the back of women's backs, I was cheering in my corner, acknowledging myself as one of those women. But you know, one of the fantastic things I learned about working with him is what many uh, entrepreneurs should learn. And it is about being selfish in looking for talent. It's not about male or female. It's not about tall or short. It's about the quality of what that person can contribute. Um, but in the context of the question that you asked, I mean, investment promotion in Nigeria, um, in the context of the wealth of Nigeria's resources, should ideally be incredibly easy. Investors should be fawning over themselves to participate in converting Nigeria's economic potential to wealth. But we recognize ourselves that there are challenges in that conversion, which then makes investment promotion a little more difficult than it should have been. The African continental free trade area is coming to life in the context of COVID. So you cannot separate it from COVID. And COVID has demonstrated that it is the most vulnerable that have actually suffered the most, which means when you think about promoting investments and Nigeria taking advantage of that agreement, we have to think in the context of the most vulnerable. And it is generally the young people and the women. Um, we can have this virtual event, but there are many for whom COVID has meant that the livelihoods have been taken away. It is particularly relevant for me, me, for women and young people, because half the Nigerian population is female, but we don't have 
50% female representation across all aspects of our lives. And it is everything, as has been said before, from politics to government to business. It is also the same in wealth distribution. But when you talk about young people, it is even more, you know, the numbers are even more scary. If you look at the age of the people that we have in leadership positions in Nigeria, um, most will be 50 and above. Um, whereas we live in a country where more than 90% of the population is under the age of 50. The median age in Nigeria is 18 and a half. The median age on the continent is 20. In the world, the median is 32. In Europe, it is 43. So it may be okay to be 43 in a leadership position in Europe because your median age. In Africa, where the median age is 20, we cannot get to the future that we're going to without involving young people. And when I think in the context of the Continental Free Trade Agreement, it actually opens an opportunity for Africa to work with itself. I mean, the, a comment that um, Mrs. O made at the beginning, if you want to go far, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go with others. That's what the Continental Free Trade Agreement does for Africa. It encourages Africans to do more with themselves and gives advantages, confers advantages deliberately for Africans doing business with each other. But we cannot fully leverage the potential of that agreement if we do not put our best foot forward. That means if we have 50% female um, if you have 50 a population that is 50% female, we ensure 50% female representation. If we have a population that is largely young, we push the young people forward. After all, the future that we're all trying to create will largely be a future that is for them, not for those of us who are near 50 or for those who are above 50. I will stop there in terms of my opening comments. Some really vital points, very, very vital points. So let me move over to Shola Akinlade. Oh, Kadria is with us. Oh, fantastic. Kadria, I've already introduced you, so please take over. Hello, Hello Kadria. Adiba. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, we have very little time, so I'm not um, going to go into protocol. I think I will just stand on existing protocols. Um, I'm not sure because I wasn't online. I had a problem with my connection, whether we introduced the rest of the panelists. In case we didn't, I will just do a short intro. And um, like Habiba said at the beginning of this program, the full profiles of everybody who's taking part in this program is online. Um, let me start by quickly introducing Monica Musonda, who is the founder and CEO of Java Foods. It's a Zambian-based food processing company. And their first product was the Easy instant noodles which has now become Zambia's leading instant noodle brand. Yewande Sitiku, you heard their talking. Um, she's the Executive Secretary and CEO of NIPC, Nigeria's foremost investment promotion agency. She talked about some of the work. Um, she made references to some of the work she's doing in that speech. Fetswanika is deeply passionate about Africa and believes that the missing ingredient on the continent is good leadership. And in line with this, he has founded two organizations that aim to catalyze a new generation of ethical entrepreneurial African leaders, uh, the African Leadership Academy and the African Leadership Network. And um, the last panelist is Shola Akin, Akin Lade, a software engineer, co-founder of Paystack and uh, the ISA maybe the um, latest millionaire in dollars in <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for being with us and for being patient. I think what I'll do is I'll just ask a few questions to get us going. And um, we have only 50 minutes. And depending on how we do, we'll open it up as well. And I think if people have questions, uh, we may not have time to actually get uh, people to ask their questions verbally. So if you could just um, send the questions directly to me so they don't get swallowed by all of the comments that have been going in the general conversation. Let me start with you, Mr. Swanika. We had the one day there referring to the fact that Africa is largely really young. Um, 18, 18 and a half is the median age in Nigeria. 50% of um, that population is women and girls. Out of those, we have about 13 million children out of school. And even for those who are going to school, we have a fairly 
difficult educational system which lacks facilities, teachers, infrastructure. So my question to you is how should we be reimagining and rethinking education in Africa in order to provide for development, for equal opportunity and create a more inclusive continent? Thank you um, for that question. Um, so your question is, how should we be reimagining education to um, create more inclusivity? So firstly, I think that, um, you know, one of the things I really believe is that our true wealth as a continent is not in our oil or gold or diamonds, it's really in our people. Uh, no society has ever become wealthy by re relying on its natural resources. It's really from the in ingenuity and creativity of its people. So and if we want to get wealthy in Africa, we have to educate our, our, our people, you know, men, women, especially women, because I think the ripple effect, as I mentioned earlier, is greater. So, um, uh, you know, this moment uh, in, in, that we are in with co in COVID is really forcing us to rethink a lot of things. Um, one of the things that I really believe is that uh, constraints drives innovation. And, you know, Africa has always been a continent of constraints. So we have to reimagine things because we don't have a lot of time. We don't have, have a lot of money. We don't have a lot of um, you know, resources. So therefore, we have to completely rethink how education happens. Um, and uh, I think there are some very exciting experiments that are happening right now with, by leveraging technology um, to really drive learning. One of the biggest opportunities that I see is uh, for us to leapfrog education systems by building the education of the future in Africa. Um, and the, that can come by really rethinking who's responsible for learning, you see, because traditionally education was um, done in an era where information was scarce. So you had to go to um, a university or a school to get it from the head of, head of the professor from the library book. But today we live in a world where information is ubiquitous and a child in a rural area in Africa today can access more information on their mobile phone than someone who was doing a PhD at Oxford or Harvard 30 years ago, because we didn't have this information. So what we need to do is to really um, um, create an education system that is not dependent on a scarce resource of teachers and professors, but one that is based on abundance, which is a system built on, uh, around young people themselves, where they can teach each other with all the content that is now available, where they can teach, where they can learn by themselves. Because peer-to-peer -peer learning and self-directed learning is a lot, is, 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 um, can be very powerful. And then you mix that with some interaction with, with those few teachers that are very qualified and that you have. And I think with that, we can then rapidly scale up education and also keep it very high quality and allow us to, in, in just one generation, in 10, 20 years, massively see a population that is better educated and that can actually drive the innovation and creativity and job and entrepreneurship that this continent needs. So what we cannot do is go back to the traditional methods. What we cannot do is continue the status quo because that's, you know, um, that is really going to continue to hinder us. We need to reimagine and build new and better ways of learning that continue to do the same thing over and over. They keep, yeah, I, I, this idea of muting me when panelists are talking is not going to work, people. So can you please leave my mic permanently on? Eh? Otherwise, we get these delays where I'm supposed to um, interject and I can't. If I could still stay with you, Mr. Swanika, um, when you look at Africa, though, the way things pan out is that Africa is not the same. You know, we keep saying Africa is not a country. So obviously, the challenges are different. Um, when you look at, for example, how technology can enable the learning of the future, access, for example, to tech, to data varies from place to place. So can I ask you to talk to us about the diversity of challenges and what, if you like, are the similarities across the continent that you can talk to and what are sort of the differences that you see and how can individual countries then deal with those um, challenges that are peculiar to them?
Yeah, it doesn't work when you mute panelists when we're having a conversation. Can you please leave all our mics on? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. You're absolutely right that uh, conditions vary across the continent. However, we do also have some, some similarities. So one thing that is very common across the continent is that we have very high levels of primary school education. So across Africa, uh, you know, because of the Millennium Development Goals, governments invested heavily in primary school education. So across the continent, you see about, on average, 70 to 80% of primary school age students are enrolled. When that goes to secondary, you drop to about 40%. When you go to tertiary, you only have about 8% enrollment. And that is quite common across the continent. So, um, you know, that is a common problem that, you know, needs to be addressed by everyone. We obviously have within different countries, different access to, um, to internet, different access to power even, right? It's a simple thing. You can give someone the internet, but if they don't have power, then they can't even use the computer, right? Because, you know, to, to access that, 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 that knowledge. Um, and, and data, you know, costs are, are, are different across different countries, et cetera. So um, I think every country obviously needs to look at its own situation and create something that is tailored to its own needs. But philosophically, philosophically, there are some common approaches that can be used everywhere. And what I was talking about earlier is um, we need to reimagine education and not just continue doing the way it's been done for 100 years or for thousands of years. Right? Uh, and Africa has been at its best when it has not followed the status quo. Even if you look at the way the continent has handled COVID, African countries took a different path than the rest of the world. And you can see the results have been slightly, have been better on the continent. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to, and we did the same with mobile phones when we leapfrog. We now need to do the same in education. Um, and so what I was talking about earlier in terms of rethinking education, uh, it's actually less an issue of technology and less an issue of access to data, much more of a mindset. If we are continuing to be, do things the traditional way, because um, young people can teach themselves um, you know, using even books, <laughs> right? The, you know, they can, they can teach each other using books. There's a system in Latin America called the Escuela Nueva system, which from primary school and secondary school doesn't, you know, leverages self-directed learning and peer-to-peer -peer learning. And they've been doing it for 25 or 30 years, even before the era of the internet with very high success rates. But it just requires thinking differently and unconventional methods. Africa will never succeed if we follow the conventional path. We need radical, unconventional ways of doing things, and that's the only way we're gonna get there. So that's the first place. So it requires political leaders, school leaders, parents, everyone to think differently and to be willing to try new things versus continuing to do the same things over and over. And that's the, that is a common problem that every country can, uh, a common way of doing things that can be applied across the whole continent. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Swanika. Um, Mr. Akilade, um, you run a very successful payment platform that is driven um, by technology. And it is only possible, really, because we've seen changes in the way we do business. In education, uh, Mr. Swanika has talked about changing our mindset and changing our philosophy. But when it comes to, say, creating job and wealth, how significant is technology going to be on the continent? And do you think we are prepared to take advantage of tech? Yeah, um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, really good to be here. Um, I guess technology is a very interesting leveler. You know, um, I think when I think about Paystack, when I think about the stories I've seen, like we all have access to the same internet. We have access to the same laptops. So someone else, somewhere else doesn't have an advantage over me. You know, when I compare like, Maybe if we want to make airplanes, for example, if I'm making airplanes in Nigeria and someone else is making like, airplanes in somewhere else, like they might have an advantage. But if I'm building software in Lagos, like there's no advantage, you know? And I think that is what makes the Paystack journey and the Paystack story very interesting, even for me, because I think people talk about Paystack and they put my name on my face. But the truth is that Paystack was built by the community, by everybody. We launched about five years ago. And what we wanted to do was to figure out how to make payments work for the continent. We wanted to accelerate digital payments in the continent. Um, and I think we made progress. You know, today we're doing five times more than what Nigeria was doing in payments before we launched. You know, today we have about 120 people and 
everybody is trying to do their best work. So I think technology gives advantages to people. So, and the advantages come in two ways, actually. So I think the first part is the people that create technology have advantages. And then the most interesting part is how do you like improve the economic opportunity in the continent? Like there are over a billion people in Africa. It's going to be so hard for cash to travel between Lagos and Lusaka. Or in fact, from Victoria Island to Ikeja. Think about how far it will take cash to travel. But with technology, it means I can sell to anyone anywhere else i can scale my business it's not gonna when it's dark it doesn't matter i will continue to make money you know so i think this generation this technology enabled generation is actually going to help improve opportunity in the continent and it's something i'm super super excited about Okay, so let me just um, take you up a little bit on what you said right at the beginning of that answer, which is that, um, you know, if you're sitting in Lagos and someone is sitting in America manufacturing planes, it might be difficult, but because you're talking about apps and programs, it's a little bit easier. But we have not seen many pay stacks in Nigeria, for example, and across the continent. You, you are sort of outliers in many ways. You're doing things that haven't been done before. So what are the challenges that make it difficult for us to see 100 pay stacks in a place like Nigeria, for example? Why do we not have the same sort of um, creativity and innovation in the tech space that is sort of scalable and that allows you to build businesses that will employ huge number of people and essentially transform the country. Yeah, no, thanks so much. I personally think it's just a matter of time. You know, I think, okay, I'll say two answers. I think the first part is just time. Like there are actually many paystacks, but you just haven't seen them. It's like paystack. Like people didn't know paystack or the paystack became paystack. So um, I would say that there are actually many paystacks and everyone is doing their own thing. And I think, Telling more stories will really help. Um, but it's also early days for us, like the investors, the employees, you know, like the, the, the system is just growing and it will only get better. So I think that's the first part of why um, they just like the, the, the few pay stacks. Um, the second part of it that really, really, really excites me is that I think now that companies like paystack now that you're seeing young when i started paystack it was hard to be a young founder to be honest like it was nobody nobody it didn't even make sense why will someone like me try to start a payments company who am i like people ask me like who is on your board <laughs> like i don't know what is the board i don't know you know so i think that things have gotten better like even the older generations are actually now more keyed in, you know, bank MDs are keyed in, everybody is keyed in, and it's now getting easier for people. If you had an idea, if you've made little progress, it's easier for people to believe in you. Because the thing about, and when you say, why are there no more pay stacks? The truth is that younger people need to be more courageous. Like, even for me, it, it didn't make sense for me to start Paystack. And I'm never going to be the one to build Paystack. I needed people to help me build Paystack. I needed investors. I needed talent. I needed support. I needed the entire ecosystem. So, and the good thing is when you set like ambitious goals, things that are bigger than you, people will actually key into it and help you. You know, so I think there will be more. And then more people, and as long as more people keep picking bigger goals and just making their own progress, of course, because it's not just about the idea, it's about like getting the train moving. I think more people are going to jump on the train and there's just going to be more progress in the ecosystem. Thank you very much, Mr. Akilade. Um, Ms. Moson, yeah. you heard Mr. Akilade there talk about the challenges of being a young um, entrepreneur. I suspect that um, the female entrepreneur also perhaps faces quite a number of challenges in trying to set up business, particularly in the formal sector. I mean, there's um, African women traditionally are entrepreneurs, but most of them are sort of in the informal sectors. So when it comes to um, the sort of work that you do and the journey you've had, what have, what have been sort of the most difficult challenges that you've had to overcome? And 
Do you believe that um, female entrepreneurship is central to growing the continent? So when Shola said that, I was, think, I was saying to myself, gosh, you should ask women entrepreneurs how hard it is. Uh, I, I know it's definitely gotten better for, me, uh, for men in tech, but for women, it is still very, very challenging, right? Um, you're, you, you are off the bat, they doubt whether you actually can continue with your idea, if you can scale it, if you have the right expertise. Is this a hobby? Um, have you thought it through? Or are you going to stop it next year? There have been so many challenges. I mean, I, I, uh, for many of you might, who might not know my own journey, I spent uh, 16 years as a corporate lawyer. You know, you study for it and you, 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 you sort of uh, get your career path going and then had a complete U-turn and moved back to my home country of Zambia, where I had not lived for 14 years and began a manufacturing business and no one would get out of bed even the, the, the bank managers, they just thought this is just not going to fly. So it was consistency, it was belief in self, it was also getting supporters. As much as mentors are important, but it was also really important to have male and female supporters who were able to open doors for you. And I mean, uh, I always try to say that food may not be as sexy, but you still need to eat it. And this is where I, I currently am I'm playing. And it's, it's proved very pivotal this year when we have found that lots of people because of the lockdowns had a lot of problems eating and affordability around food and this is where I want to encourage women that you know there are many of us and there are many women who are already entrepreneurs but are doing it maybe uh, in the evenings uh, doing it for to supplement incomes to pay for school fees or etc but it's not, not now is the time really to think about scale we're not going to change anything for women entrepreneurs if we're going to keep it micro and we need to now through platforms like this really Really be very clear in our ask in order for us to move the dial for women to move forward. What is that that we need right now in order for us to have many more women entrepreneurs at scale? Is it just financing? Is it technical support and assistance? Is it tax breaks and incentives? Is it key partnerships? These are sorts of things we really need to challenge. Is it also legislating a certain percentage of the procurement budget towards women run and women owned businesses? We need to challenge very clearly our policy Policymakers and those who are saying that they're championing women's women-run businesses or women empowerment and say, okay, if that's the case, this is what we expect to see in this period of time. We we are anxious, we are demanding for changes now, not tomorrow. We want them now. But we, we as women also have to be very clear in our ask in order for us to be very clear on how we can move forward. And, and in terms of just having that conversation, particularly with, um, um, if you like, the male section of, you know, um, the business community, whether it is in trying to access finance, what are the things that we should be telling men about why it is significant for them to support female entrepreneurs, why it matters? It matters because, as we know, a lot of the decision making is done by our male counterparts. It's the way the system has been run. Ultimately, it goes back to one man or two or a, a board of men who have to uh, agree to lend or agree to support a, a certain venture, even if it fails, because it's not just women run ventures which fail. So do men, male run ventures, but they still get the support. So it's really kind of saying we really need champions at every level. And I know I'm speaking more on business because this is my background, but it's the same in the public sector that you need a champion to say, why do we need 50% uh, representation in parliament? Why do we need more women on boards? This is what it will bring. This is what we're going to show younger women that you can achieve at the highest level, you can create change, you can run a business which is successful, you are able to access financing, um, access partnerships, and really build and really create wealth and development. I think we should also talk about, um, you know, Fred was saying something about wealth, but I always, in my context, I always think about development because we are a continent of great potential and we love to talk about, it, but we really need to create this, you know, develop. We need to develop infrastructure, we need to develop people we need to change the way in which we do business more women need to be involved but we need everyone to support the push forward okay um let me bring you on this if you could hear because often we talk about development or wealth and um no doubt entrepreneurship and private sector are significant drivers of that but perhaps the most significant partner in many many um countries particularly in africa is government now you've been in the private sector, you've been in government, and 
despite the fact that we kind of know the two need to work together, often they are at odds with each other. And so based on your experience of sort of working with governments now and having worked in the private sector, how do we bridge that divide? How do we make sure that government is doing the things it ought to do so that entrepreneurs and the private sector can, can thrive and together, you know, build our communities? Um, thank you, Kadaria. Um, the biggest thing we need is a change in mindset. We assume government to be them and we to be private sector. And to be honest, I, I made the same assumptions when I was in the private sector. I mean, government is people like you and I who happen to be in a position in the public sector at this time. It wasn't something generally that they were born with. And if you look at the people in government, you know, um, I mean, government is, there, there's a political government, you know, people like me who come and go, whether they were elected or they were appointed. And then there's the civil service who essentially stay, whether the political people go and come or not. If you look at the multitude of that, um, we, we, in the countries that have done the best in taking advantage of um, the power of the country, we've pushed our best people forward in government and in business. We have not necessarily seen that, you know, in my own view in Nigeria. From an information perspective, and I always say this, you know, if you think about the information that you need to, to convert to economic opportunity, without a doubt, that information lies disproportionately on the side of government. I dare anybody in the private sector who thinks they have the same depth of information that government does to put their hands up. Um, what, what, what we're missing in government is the quality of intellectual capital to translate that information well to economic advantage. So we actually need people like Shola working in government. You know, we need people like Fred working in government. Shola, Shola is squeezing his face already. Can't imagine himself working in government. The reality is that that is what it takes to make it happen. The same if mentality. You are not able to make a legitimate two hundred million dollars in government. No, no, no. He will not. <laughs> he will certainly not make a legitimate two hundred million dollars in government. And that is not the point. The point is that the quality of his grey matter and what he brings to the table, we need that unlocking the things in government that make it difficult for us to see two hundred pay stacks. You know. You, you say, if we say that pay stack is one in a million, Nigeria is a country of 200 million people. So we need at least 200 pay stacks. If, and that's even if it is one in a million. If it is more common than one in a million, then we need more than 200. So if we cannot see 200 pay stacks, it means there's something about the way, you know, government policies and the like are organized that makes it difficult for us to see them. But until we have... What is that thing? What is that thing that means you have people sitting on the sort of information you've just described, which you feel is critical yes. to what we're doing? Um, and I know that you probably will speak to Nigeria, and that's fine because we've got people from other countries, and I can then ask them to tell us about their experiences. But what is this about government, the way it is currently structured, that means we cannot take advantage of that? significant information that you say we have okay so i still work for government and i want to go back to the office on <laughs> monday and work with my colleagues um but you know the the one thing that i have seen um i am sure that when shola is recruiting when fred is recruiting same thing for monica and yourself and when at adopt peter's side certainly recruited me i mean if he did not get all of the best people i must be the one person who made it through but otherwise, the focus, without a doubt, was getting the best people for his business. So we first need to do that in government. To get the best people, they will not make $200 million, you know, from, from um, one adventure um, that they start, you know, that then blows. But they can contribute a lot more to the country if they're completely focused on altruistic things that are for the greater good. So you have to pay them a living wage. So they're not looking over the ledge looking at people like shola and being jealous of him but i take pride in the fact that they're building a foundation that will allow a lot more people to come to the table so in my view we need reforms in the public sector but without a doubt we need 
all of our best people, all. Such is the magnitude of the problem we have in Nigeria that we need all our best hands on deck. In every football team, you put your best 11. In government, we should put our best people. We don't want them to do it for 20 years because the cost of working for government is high. But if we do it like a relay, where you do it for a period, you pass on the button. So I do my time and I pass on the button. And I like to pass on the button to Shola when I'm done. And I am serious. <laughs> if we all understand where the shoe pinches, we can do a lot more in fixing it. Thank you very much, Wandi. Let me go back to Fred. I have a question for him. And coincidentally, questions have started coming in. So I may actually combine just so that we get as much as possible out of the limited time that we have. You talked there about the fact that we need to start thinking about perhaps um, changing the philosophy of education in terms of specifically you talked about who is responsible for education. And we know that across the continent, um, the governments have not done particularly well in you know, um, funding education, structuring education. I mean, in a place like Nigeria, for example, people are now being educated um, for like 30 years past. So my question is, are you asking for government to take, totally take its hands off education? Is it something that drastic? Or what are you asking? And if I could then tag on the question that came uh, for you from uh, Ori Fi Uyo, who says, what is your take on decentralized or lo localized educational system? A lot of educational systems being practiced in different African countries are borrowed and inherited. And should we be looking to have our own homegrown educational system? And I think you kind of started speaking to that a little bit earlier. Um, you are muted, right? Exactly. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, you're asking about the role that government should play. Um, if the, any, because you talked about changing, um, taking taking uh, responsibility for education and perhaps making it not the traditional way. Yes, I think absolutely government does need to play a role in education. It's one of the most important things that governments can do because they, the role of government is to develop society and to, and to meet the needs of its citizens. One of the most fundamental needs is education. And governments will be letting their people down if they like, take a complete hands-off approach to education. So, but the role that they need to play is very similar to the role that they that believe that government needs to play in most things, which is um, enforce the rules. So I create the rules, enforce the rules, and then get out of the way. And I think very often government doesn't do the third part. They actually get in the way, right? Because there are many, many creative people um, whether it's school leaders or you know um, uh, families and, and, and so forth, who could and companies even who could get involved in education, but the rules need to be set by the government. So um, government obviously has you know significant resources at stake, uh, and they can move millions of, of people. We cannot scale anything without government, right? So private sector will always do you know small interventions here. There, where a lot of the innovation can come from. But ultimately, those innovations need to then be scaled through the public systems, right? So um, I don't think it's an either or of government only or private sector only. I think you need both, right? So private sector solutions, um, you know, for example, in, sec in, in uh, secondary and, and higher education, uh, I think you can have a lot of private sector players in that sector. Whereas for primary, you know, I think it tends to be something that government will probably have to be playing more of a deeper, of a bigger role. Already in Africa, about 45% of, of, of students go to private schools. Right, that's the, you know, and and I'm not talking about fancy private schools, um, you know, with uh, uh, you know swimming pools and everything. They're, I'm talking about schools in in uh, you know uh, in shanty towns, in you know in, in in shacks that are that are that you know some enterprising people have taken on their own to to develop. So those need to be to be to be enhanced, um, and 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 of course then you've got the rest, 55 percent who are in the public sector. So we need both. Um, and, uh, and and to the, to the uh, does the future that we want to build um, um, require us to have some degree of free education at least up to a certain level, or are you saying that um, it has to continue to be 
half and half where people sort of take um, their kids, you know, to private school if they can afford it, and then government provides for those who can't. Well, yeah, I think, you know, you, you, we need both because African governments have limited budgets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, if you have a thriving private uh, school system, and, and again, remember, many of the people who are going to these private schools are paying a lot of money, right? There's the fancy private schools, but then the, most of the people are being educated in low-cost private schools. So let's try and improve the quality of those schools, right? You can, you know, by teacher training or enhancing technology or, you know, but also governments need to create policies that don't penalize those schools, um, and allows them to thrive and allows them to be creative and, you know, things like, you know, national exams, policies, et cetera. Those are government rules, right? So mm -hmm. government can, 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 can innovate and create the incentives for the private sector to step up, but also they need to do their bit. You the know, the reason I asked that question, Fred, is because there's an ongoing debate in Nigeria in particular about whether the reason why our educational system, the public education system is on the point of collapse is because we've allowed private sector schools to thrive and people in public office have all largely chosen to sort of take their awards and their children out of those systems and put them in private education. And as a result of that, are not paying as much attention to the schools because they have no skin in the game. Mm -hmm. But that ultimately Paul, goes down to leading by example. So I think one of the first things that public sector officials in Nigeria and the rest need to do is to put their children in those public schools. They need to also send their families for health care to public hospitals, not to send them overseas. And the minute they start doing that, then hopefully they will start to realize that the, actually the quality of the, of the services that they're offering to their citizens are not up to scratch. And then it will provide the right incentives. But ultimately, that comes from leadership at the top. The, the, up to the highest leaders in the country need to mandate that your children in the public sector need to go to the public schools and to the public hospitals and et cetera, et cetera. When that happens, then you will start to see, uh, you know, the right things. But again, it's, it's not that simple. It, you know, it requires leadership. The problems to most, the, 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 the solutions to most of the problems that we have in Africa boil down to one thing, leadership. Until we get leadership acting in the right way, we will never fix these problems because the solutions are there. <laughs> but it just requires leadership, requires political will to drive the change in the public sector, in the private sector, and then collectively we can move this continent forward. And I think that's really what, what we need to do. And to the, the question about should it be decentralized or centralized, I think, again, you need to take into account, account um, you know, the, the contexts um, of, of, of each country and each, each, each uh, city. And, and you do need to empower local leaders at the you know, municipal level, at the you know, district level, to, because they know um, best what's going on in those regions, right? Um, and, and, and I think we'll be able to, 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 to get the change started. But it, it all starts from the top, with leadership at the top. If that doesn't fix, if that's not fixed, we'll, we'll always we'll continue to be where we are. Um, Ms. Mosondo, obviously what sets entrepreneurs apart from other people is that often they don't wait for anybody from the top to tell them what to do. They kind of just get on with it. So in terms of the future we want to see when it comes to entrepreneurship, what for you are the sort of um, most significant things that need to happen for, ent for entrepreneurship to thrive? And what would be, in your view, evidence that we are getting it right? So like I said, I think uh, we are seeing entrepreneurship thriving. What you want to see is that we're moving away from micro and we're growing businesses. But what we would like to see, I definitely, is this, you know, we've had a big discussion about how young the continent is. And I think what we should be doing is how can we support these great new ideas come to, you know, grow into uh, viable uh, businesses sooner. So we have seen the success in many countries of incubation hubs or innovation centers where people or young people are able to take ideas in, test them, develop them, and perhaps even uh, find ways to pitch money to get you know, your first angel investors in order for you to grow the business. We need to see many more of that. We need to see uh, policies into place. We see in countries like Rwanda where there are really great policies which encourage startups, encourage um, a certain um, growth in certain sectors because they have seen particularly the growth um, in certain key sectors or they see that they have competitive advantages in certain sectors. 
and then they support the growth in those sectors. So you, re you very much need to have um, an infrastructure, whether it's policy and also just physical infrastructure being built to encourage the growth of really great ideas in order to grow business. I mean, this is the only way, the one thing we're definitely seeing is that there's no shortage of great ideas on the continent. How can we grow them? How can we grow? And, and given that this is, we're focusing on women, how can we make sure that, that some of this um, women, great capital or great partnership with technical support develop. is being targeted particularly at women? Um, Mr. Akilade, I want to ask you here, what in your view are the opportunities available to women, um, both you know, from a work point of view, but also from an entrepreneur point of view in the fintech space, particularly in um, um, the country that um, you know very well, Nigeria? Yeah, no, thank you so much for that. Um, I think that, okay, so you said from the work point of view first and then, um, and then the, the entrepreneurship. I think from like the talent perspective, I think that there's just, when I saw a question about like structure, for example. I think when, when, when people are starting companies, um, there's just so much experience that is needed to like help you figure it out, you know? And I think that even from my experience, very coincidental, but a lot of my early hires, like people that really supported me, like were women, because I think when, when I started and I, I, like, I literally needed people to help me. Like, that's all, like, when I'm trying to hire people, when I'm, I'm begging them, I'm not like, you know, I'm not having a negotiation or anything. I'm just begging, I'm just, please come and help me figure this thing out, you know? and. So I think one of the things that I, I, one of the immediate opportunities I think people should look at as like, what are some companies or what are, where are founders that, or who are people, and it can be men, it can be women, who are people that are trying to do interesting things but need extra help and how can we help them? Um, and so I think that's the, that's, that's, that's one mental model that I think worked for me. So a lot of my early people, they reached out to me on their own and were like, oh, how can we help you, Shola? And of course, there's so many ways you can help me. So I think that's one mental model. Um, and tied to that is just like the conversation I have with people also is like, how do we get everyone to bring themselves to work? You know, bring your whole self to work. You know, she talked about me working in government, you know, the truth is that. <laughs> yeah, so you said that because there's a question here. <laughs> to Mr. Sidiku uh, from Nike Akinto here, who says, can Mr. Akilade work on a project with you, Mr. Sidiku, as a consultant, so that he can give back to the community while you are in office? <laughs> in fact, we have a project that is ongoing now. Shola, we can talk today. We can start <laughs> on it on Monday. We can commit to the community of the audience that is listening to us today. That in three months, in six months, they will see X, Y, Z. I'm ready today. I'm not joking. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm, re I'm ready to. <laughs> we were laughing about this, but there seems to be a lot of aversion when it comes to talented people like yourself, Mr. Swanika, even Mrs. Mosundu. It's almost as if you guys see government as a leper and you just refuse to get involved. And Mr. Sidiku keeps making the point that if all of the talented people in Africa keep sticking to private sector work, then we're going to continue having a problem because government is perhaps a more significant partner in terms of development, wealth creation, and generally building a society that looks after our most vulnerable and which is inclusive. So I'd like all three of you to speak to this, please. Yeah. Um, to, 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 uh, but before I pass it, just to round up and talk to her, because that was going to be my last point on your answer around entrepreneurship. I think it's not a government versus no government. You know, it's not about, uh, it's for me personally, like, I'm not, I'm not an entrepreneur. When people call me an entrepreneur, I just laugh. Like, I don't know what entrepreneurship is. But I like to create the future I want, you know. Um, and unfortunately, unfortunately, entrepreneurship is that. Thing that allows you to do what you want to do without asking for permission, without begging people. I, I don't want to beg people, I just want to work. So when your initial question to me is like, what opportunities exist for women you know, in entrepreneurship? I would say that 
in the fintech, I'm going to say like, there's so many problems that entrepreneurship would allow people like just figure out the problems and create that future we want to create. And you made valid points. It's so hard for women to raise money. Like we looked at the stats and someone was talking about the number of women that have raised over a million dollars in the last five years. Like it's so low, you know, but I think that as we continue to like get more people, it becomes easier. It, and and we're talking about it now, the whisker conference. Like, so let I think the answer is it's not about government. <laughs> There's no 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 it's not about government for me. It's just about where so that is dodging working for government. Where, so where can I wrong. find a safe space to do my work and meet the mission, my goals I want to? And if I can find that in government, I will do it. But just know that I'm not. I'm not trying to fight. I'm not trying to do it. I just want to work. So that's what I would just say. Yeah. Thank you, Because on this point, it's really interesting, um, Yawanda. It's not about private sector versus government, right? And I think I talked about this that we all want to get to the end. We all want to live in a prosperous country where. And the fact is that government is not creating jobs every day it's the private sector so we all have to work together i mean we want to speak to you as government to say this is what we need in the policy direction in the law in your flexibility in order for us to make more jobs in order for us to change the society we live in so it's not i i get you but we can't all work for government you you need some good people in private sector too <laughs> mrs monica Something keeps happening to Mr. Swanika's uh, microphone. Ah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, they need to unmute me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as I mentioned before, I don't believe that government should be big. Government should be very, very small. We need relatively few, but, but good people in government. And like I talked about, so that they, they make the rules, they enforce the rules, and then they get out of the way to allow the ingenuity of their people to actually solve these problems. So that's the first thing. I don't think, therefore, that we should be all be trying to get into government. Um, I would be willing to serve in government, but I don't want to be a politician. So I think there's, there's, we need to separate the two because there's being a politician and then there's working in government in the institutions. Um, and I think what we need to strengthen are much more the institutions. So the people who run the central bank, who run the tax authority, who run the health uh, you know, departments, the people who are in the layer below the politicians because the skills required to win an election are not the skills required to govern effectively. Because what do you need to win an election? You need to be able to lie, to, to manipulate people, to um, tell people, to form co coalitions with people whose values you are not aligned with. Maybe we should be talking about contest. It's politicians of the future. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a popularity contest to win an election. Those are, that doesn't tell you how to balance a budget properly or how to create the right policies and everything like that. So what we need to do is to separate the two. And I think that... It, you know, I would be willing to go in and work in a public sector institution if I didn't have to deal with the politics. So let the politicians come and dance and sing and, 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 and win the elections, but let's put good people to run the actual institutions on a day-to-day -day basis. We have maybe 10 minutes left, and I'd like to really sort of see if I can get us to sort of just dive into like specifics. And again, Fred, let me start with you. And um, you talked some very interesting ideas about the future of education. So if you can, can you help me paint a picture of the specific things that you see the education that we should be aspiring to on this continent and the sort of time frame within which you think African countries need to sort of ensure that they've changed mindsets, changed the way they're working. And perhaps let us know, since you're in that sector and you work across multiple countries, whether well, that conversation is actually taking place. Okay. So I think that, that, as I mentioned earlier, the single biggest thing we need to do is to change our mindset about how education happens. So um, the first step is we need to rethink dependence on teachers because we will never get enough teachers quickly enough, right? And go back to our natural base. Because if you think about it, um, human beings are natural learners. There's no curriculum that teaches you how to walk or language. At the age of six months, you start learning that by yourself, right? And um, when you then go to school at the age of five, then we start taking away your natural ability. And then the, suddenly the teacher starts spoon-feeding uh, spoon you with knowledge. 
and then you become more and more helpless. And by the time you get to university, you are completely useless because now you just, you have, we've taken away your natural ability to learn. So what we need to do is go back to your six month old self where you are naturally hungry and, and a self-learning individual and then equip that young person to actually continue learning by themselves. And that then becomes surrounding them with knowledge and information and technology. And, 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 and then the other thing I would do is um, I would eliminate all subjects in primary school except English and mathematics. Because today you have, you know, you, you meet someone in primary school, they're learning 14 subjects and that spreads their attention too far on, on too few things. But most of the knowledge in the world is built on those two things. We will not compete as a continent if we don't understand mathematics and science and technology. So solid foundation in math, solid foundation in English. And then when they get to secondary and tertiary, they can, they can start learning the other things with that foundation. Because even if we give you, you know, a, a computer and we give you bandwidth, if you don't have the basic foundation in math and English, you won't be able to do the self-directed learning. So those are some of the things, but again, requires political will. And, you know, and within, if we did this within 15 years, we could have a, a massively educated continent that can, that can compete. You know, it's not going to take a lot of time, but it just requires, again, unconventional thinking. Right. Um, let me come to Ms. Mosunjo, and I suspect this will be sort of the last set of questions before I then allow you guys to sort of give us your final thoughts. Um, obviously, this is conversation um, accelerated by COVID-19. I'm sure at some point Zoom would have become something, but it is now something because, you know, COVID accelerated it. So what are the lessons that you've learned as an entrepreneur through um, these difficult times, particularly because we hear of the impact of the pandemic on businesses. And I imagine that businesses that are run by entrepreneurs that may not have, if you like, the sort of structural support that big multinationals have, um, particularly went through quite a, a difficult time. So what was your experience of that like? And um, are there any lessons that you'd like to share, particularly with other women entrepreneurs who are, you know, listening to this conversation. Yeah. So COVID was really very, um, was unexpected, I think. We, we saw it happening elsewhere, but we didn't really understand what it meant to us and, and, and actually on the business side. So you would remember in March, all across the continent, um, people really reacted very quickly to a public health disaster without really thinking through the implications on business. So we saw in Southern Africa, all the countries around Zambia having, uh, doing lockdowns, uh, restricting movements to essential workers, uh, closing schools, hospitality industries, etc. And then there was questions about, well, then how do we move uh, uh, goods and services into many of these countries which rely on a lot of imports? I mean, in Southern Africa, 70% of food is actually imported. So with border lockdowns, there was a panic four weeks later about what people were going to eat. But also the, the most significant thing about COVID is the businesses it directly affected were, were really uh, the sectors where women had actually grown their businesses. So a number of schools um, in Zambia, for instance, are owned and operated by women. Uh, the hospitality sector, all these sectors were forced to shut, shut down by COVID. And remember, the key things then happen is that, well, how do I now pay my obligations, which included employees, uh, rent, maybe um, loan payments, even if you went to a loan shark and borrowed some money for operations, all these things now came up. And nobody also could foresee how long the crisis was going to be. And I remember for us, we were just sure it was going to be a few weeks, and it was four months. And you can imagine with many women, um, including myself, if we have no income for four months, the business is dead. So what, what some of the lessons we learned very quickly, I mean, after a month of realizing that it wasn't going away, was to relook at our business and saying, what could we do under this new kind of situation or crisis that we're being faced with? How can I deliver my goods or services to my customers more effectively uh, without um, injuring or harming my employees, but also keeping my prices at a relative, uh, re relatively low base? So we did um, migrate to using online uh, delivery services. But we also looked at where our strengths were in this time and what people wanted in this time. So because schools were not open, we found that a lot of the, we, we are a very big instant noodle manufacturer. We saw our sales come down during the times that schools were closed because that's what kids eat a lot. And we had a migration to a fortified cereal that we do. Um, we do it mostly for emergency support. But we now saw that we, uh, people were thinking about nutrient-dense meals, were asking questions about what I need to eat to be healthy. 
uh, and to ward off COVID. So we saw sales grow in another line. And then we quickly realized our messaging had to change. So the lesson there was that, yes, we were in a crunch. Our, our, our biggest product was uh, declining in sales, but we quickly saw what we could do to help cushion that. And, and so that's my, the first lesson to other um, business owners would be look around at what you can think about what you can do with the skills that you have with the current business and with the customers that you have, because maybe they're asking for a different offering at this time. I think also we have to think about business continuity. I mean, it sounds fancy, but it's the reality. I mean, how can you continue the business to run over a period of time? If you have a loan, it's time to go speak to your bank manager and say, this is my situation. How can I get better funding on better terms or give me a break and a, or a holiday? If you've signed a supply, a long-term supply agreement, you need to go speak to that customer and say, I actually cannot deliver because of this situation. I can't get the workers in or I can't get my supplies in. But it really was a situation now. How can you continue and perhaps not pick up where you left off because the environment has, continu has continued to change. But how can we, you know, as a business continue? So I think really um, it's, been, it's been difficult. It has shown us that um, things can happen and really badly affect businesses, but we must be prepared to uh, shake ourselves off and continue. We must be prepared to look for opportunities even in crisis, there's always opportunities. So if you are manufacturing toilet paper, I hope you're manufacturing masks as well. You know, so there's always opportunity in a good crisis. Don't waste a crisis. And also keep the heat on. As I said, you know, really challenge our policymakers during this time and say, actually, these are the key issues which have affected us. Not those, you know, those things you put in your development plan, which actually are not really helpful right now. These are the five points which can make a difference to women-run, women-owned businesses right now and can make a difference and bring and, and make a difference to lives and incomes of people. And I think that has been a lesson for me. So I've done a lot of um, lobbying to make people understand the impacts of COVID have had on women-run businesses and hoping not just locally, but internationally, we continue to get the right support for women. Thanks. Okay, and Mr. Akinlade, before I sort of go to Mrs. Yewande to um, wrap it all up, um, what does the future hold for your business? And um, at the beginning of our conversation, you talked about the fact that when you started, to a certain extent, you had a lot of women supporting you. Um, does Paystack have like a gender inclusion policy that is quite deliberate and focused on trying to sort of support women, um, particularly in tech and in fintech as well? Yeah, no, thanks so much. Um, so the first question around what the future holds for us, I think we're just continuing um, to double down on our mission. I think even though we've made progress, there's still a lot of work that needs to happen. Like payments is still difficult, commerce is still difficult. Um, and I think Paystack's mission is to figure out how to make sure that anybody can accept payments from anywhere, anywhere in the world. And I think we'll continue to make that happen. Um, and we'll facilitate payments within Nigeria, across Africa, and between Africa and the rest of the world. Um, on the second question around Paystack's um, deliberate um, gender inclusion policy, I think the, I'll start from the bad part. The bad part is that it's so hard. It's been so hard for us to like, uh, and it's one of the places we've failed, especially on the engineering side. You know, it's just been so hard to like have gender inclusion um, or just have gender parity in engineering, you know, and we're continuing to like, continue to like figure it out and have a lot of gender diversity. Um, and I think we're making a lot of progress there, but I think that's one part that we failed. That said, we've tried to overcompensate in other fields. So our finance team today is seven people, all women, you know, um, my head of product, woman, head of business of, of um, um, operations, a woman. So I think all the non-engineering hires and on that side, we overcompensate there while we continue to figure out how to solve um, the problem. Thankfully, and, and one of the mistakes I see companies make, and I think Paystack is trying so hard not to make on the gender part on engineering hiring also is that while we have like a long-term plan, so you have to like hire very young engineers, um, young women engineers. Uh, you see that you go to the company and like the leaders are still men. And then the people 
the junior, the interns are women, you know. So I think, and so it was very important for us to solve that, you know. I think thankfully we just got a very senior engineering manager, she's a woman. Um, and so I'm happy with the slight progress we're making, but the truth is that I think we have failed and we will continue to just figure out how to make it uh, better. Thank you, but thank you so much. I think this is really good and this thanks so awesome. everything, yeah. <laughs> I want to end with two quick questions. One comes from Jomokia Adeke, who says, would you consider setting up a three to six month sabbatical program at NIPC funded by private sector, which for instance, loans their talent to NIPC to work on short key term projects. Experienced talent, for example, abounds now that is between jobs due to COVID-19. So if you could respond to that question and maybe finally talk to us about um, how we kind of encourage the government um, to create an enabling environment so that young people that are creative and innovative do not get stifled. And I based this, I think, on a question that I saw earlier from someone, but it has disappeared. So I'm sorry, I can't say your name, but it's taken from um, someone asked this earlier. But you know, there's so many questions coming in that I don't have the person's name. And then we have to wrap, I'm afraid, after that. Okay, thank you, Kadare. I would certainly be happy to take um, mentees, sorry, uh, volunteers for three to six months. To be honest, we tried to set up a mentorship, not a mentorship program, sort of like an internship program at NIPC. That would be for three to six months. But the issue kept going back to who was going to fund it um, because there, there was some support that the people um, needed. But without a doubt, whether I'd be receptive to it, the answer is 100% yes. What can we do to, what can we, you know, what, speaking as a Nigerian, do in terms of ensuring an improvement in the business environment? The first thing that all of us need to do is we need to leave it on the agenda. We need to keep it on the agenda. We need to keep it high on the agenda. So the private sector needs to keep giving government feedback about what is not working so that nobody in government is disillusioned about the fact that if you read it in a report that it is working, that means that it is working. That's the first thing. The second thing that we need to do is we need to be honest with ourselves about the quality generally of what we have, the people in government. So if you want a high quality output, the quality of policies and the like, we all need to be prepared to help. Um, and I found when I worked, when I was in banking and I worked with the Securities and Exchange Commission on policy drafting, we actually had a committee that drafted the policies. We didn't suggest the policies they should. We didn't suggest to them that they should introduce XYZ policy. We wrote it out. We wrote out the policy the way we thought it should be, and we gave it to them to review. And I found that they took on 90 something odd percent of what we put on the table. But we, as a private sector, who know where the shoe pinch is, actually put it in writing. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Monica Musonda, Fred Swanika, um, Shola Akilade, and Yowande Sidiku for joining us this afternoon. And thank you for your patience, because I know um, you waited a little bit longer than you anticipated because of the changes we had to the program. On behalf of WISCA, thank you so much for this um, joining us for this conversation in the future we want. Thank, thank you, you thank you, Shola, I'm coming yeah. after you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Yeah. This is headhunting in practice. Monica, lovely to see you. Kadaria, thank you. This is headhunting okay. in practice. So yeah. thank you so much to our distinguished panelists, CEO of Java Foods, Monica Musonda. Yay! CEO of Nigerian Investment Promotion Council, Yewande Sadiku. She really is going out there promoting Nigeria and business in Nigeria. Thank you, Yewande. Founder African Leadership Academy. Fred Swanika, Fred, you know now Nigerians, you know, if they can afford it, they're sending their children to your academy. It's life transforming. Thank you so, so much. Co-founder and CEO of Paystack, Shola Akinlade. Shola, thank you. Thank you for also being honest about your failure when it comes to gender representation. Let me just tell you, about 40% of, of STEM um, degrees are held by women. 24% of PhDs in STEM, that STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, are held by women, researchers, and so on. So the competent women are out there. You just have to go look for them. Thank you for being so open and honest about that. And thank you to our co our moderator, par excellence, Kadria. Thank you for overcoming the challenges you had and for taking control. And I, we all saw 
the difference, the quality of this panel discussion was superlative. Thank you very much. It was excellent and truly inspiring.